you yeah you right there you are the center of the universe and today i'm going to prove it to you hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to the science of elite without with astronomy now this is going to be a more of a science video rather than an elite video but i hope you still find it interesting and it might be a little longer because there's a lot of complicated stuff here so to be warned now the introduction statement there is technically correct but we need to get our terminology correct because we're working with two different versions two different types of universe of the universe there is what's what's known as the universe which is everything that we can see everything that we can't see and also everything that we will never be able to see but it is also things that everything that ever has been and everything that ever will be so the definition of the universe does not just expand into space it also expands in a time dimension um, this is a huge mind-boggling thing that's completely impractical to work with so to make life a little bit easier we have a definition called the observable universe which is as the name suggests everything we can see but also things that we can't see it's not because dark matter we can't see it's not part of the observable universe it is it's it's just everything that we could potentially see if we knew how that's the two definitions we're going to be, be working with today but before we can begin to understand um, where the center of the universe actually is, we of course need to know how distances are actually measured um, on larger scales. And to get that, we need to get a tool called the, the Cosmology Distance Ladder. It's a series of, of discrete methods, different methods used to measure distances in space, and they work at various distances. If we take uh, objects within our solar system, a common method is radar ranging. Um, basically, you take a big old radar dish, you bounce a, uh, send a large, a, a strong radio signal towards a planet. Um, it will bounce off the planet and come back. You measure the time it takes the signal to go out there and come back again. And then you can, if you know the speed of light, then you can calculate how far away it is. So this works well within within our old solar system. But obviously, as soon as we move outside the solar system, it's gonna begin to be uh, we're gonna begin to get into issues here. Um, because first of all, the object would be so far away that we'd have to wait like potentially like tens or hundreds of years before the signal come back, and by then it will be so weak that we can't really detect it anyway. We might be by then, but it's not going to help us a lot right now. So for close objects, um, we're using a method called the Pell Axe. Um, you know this this method intuitively. Basically, if you if you like hold out your finger and you close one eye and then you alternate between the two eyes. Um, you will see the thing, your finger like kind of move according to the background. It's the same thing we're using here when we look at a star. Um, we can take a picture of the star, look where it is according to the background star. So that would be like other galaxies or stars outside our own Milky Way. Then we've got to wait half a year. And by then, the Earth would have moved uh, around the other side of the sun. And if we then measure it again, we will see that that star should then have moved according to the background stars, which we assume to be static. Um, and then based on how much it moved, we can measure that angle. And then um, yeah, based on that, we can then calculate how far away it is. This method is useful out to 15, 16,000 light years. So if we take a look at the Milky Way, that kind of gives us a like just over halfway to uh, to the center um, of, of the Milky Way. That's kind of like our own small like corner of the galaxy. This is where the this this uh, this method is, is useful. Um, but for things far away it's it's we don't really have the accuracy to measure that uh, accurately enough but of course that we didn't need to measure um things further away in our galaxy what we use is called standard candles a standard candle is a object that we know the luminosity of that means we know how much light it's emitting and we then use the inverse square law to basically calculate um how far it is by looking at how bright we're seeing it so it's it's quite simple. I mean, if you if you imagine you have a lamp, if you stand close to the lamp and look at it, it's very very bright. But if you walk uh, far away from it, it's not as bright. So the further away, further away it is, the more faint it should be. Um, so we need to find objects where we know the luminosity, and in many cases we can determine it by the color of the star. If you're looking at single stars, at least. And you, if you've seen some of the previous uh, Science of Elite videos, you will see this HR diagram. It's perfect for many things. Um, and what we can see in this is we can see the relation between the temperature uh, and thereby the color of the star and, and its luminosity, depending on where it is in its life cycle. If we can look at the color of the star and we can then determine 
by um, um, by the color which type of star it is, what, what big it is. Then we can see the luminosity, where we know how much light it should emit. And then we can see how, how uh, faint or how bright we see it. And based on that, we can kind of calculate uh, a, a guesstimate of how, how far it is. But of course, this requires us to be able to see individual stars, meaning that this is useful within our own Milky Way, pretty much. So anything within our Milky Way, we can use this method to um, um, to kind of get a distance, an idea of distances. But it requires that we know what type of object it is that we are looking at. Um, otherwise, of course, we can't make that assumption that we can calculate the, the luminosity from its uh, its color. This also works for other objects. Like, for instance, if we look at a supernova explosion, um, these are so powerful that even if they happen in another, in another galaxy, um, the light emitted from an explosion like that will completely outpower um, any all the stars in the galaxy. It will be magnitude uh, brighter. So it can be assumed, and especially if we if we know the brightness of the galaxy beforehand, then supernova explosion happens, then we know the brightness of the galaxy during the explosion. Um, we can then basically subtract the, the light that was from the galaxy before, assuming that that's constant, and then we can see how much extra light was emitted from the supernova explosion. And since we know how much light they should emit, we can use the same method to kind of look how, how bright do we see the supernova, and then we can calculate the distance to the galaxy. But of course, we can't do that if there's not a supernova explosion and these are rare and sitting around waiting for it if you want to know the distance to a specific galaxy the well that could take years um potentially it might never happen in, in your lifetime and if it does you i mean you could be unlucky and it was a cloudy day and there was no telescopes available to look at it or something like that even though it's something that people often prioritize but anyway we need other methods to calculate the distance to galaxies now and this is now when we begin to move into the meat of this video, where we begin to look at the distances and how distances are calculated on an intergalactic scale, so between galaxies. Now, pretty much everything in the every galaxy in the universe, apart from a few close galaxies like the Andromeda Galaxy and some of the smaller ones, um, every other galaxy is moving away from us. And the further away they are, the faster they move away. Um, so already there, it might seem like we are the center of the universe since everything is moving away from this point. But as you'll see later, that's not necessarily the case. And so now we know that there's a relation between the distance and how fast they're moving away. Now, the fact that they're moving away is not necessarily due to their what's called a peculiar velocity. The peculiar velocity is the, the speed something moves through space. It's more due to the fact that the universe is expanding. Um, you can kind of imagine this as if you have a rubber band and on that rubber band are two ants. Uh, you have one ant standing still on one side, you have another ant on the other side um, walking, uh, let's say towards the other ant. And we could then take the rubber band and we could expand it, we could stretch it. So even though the ant is walking towards the other one, it's getting further away because the rubber band is expanding. It's the same thing that happens in the universe. Even though the galaxies might have a peculiar motion moving towards us, um, they, because of the expansion of the universe, they will be dragged further away from us. Okay, so because of this movement away from us, because the universe is, the universe is being basically stretched as uh, light is flying, flying towards us, you can imagine a, a, a small package of light, a photon with a certain wavelength that's been emitted, and as it is traveling towards us, it will be stretched out to longer and longer wavelengths because of the like the universe is being stretched. So we can see on the wavelength how much has been redshifted. So it's been moved towards more and more red light. But of course, we still need to know what the wavelength was when it started in order to calculate how much has been redshifted. And to do that, we kind of look at this, the spectrum of a galaxy and we look for certain peaks and valleys in the spectrum. And these kind of work like fingerprints. And we are looking for a certain combination of peaks and, and valleys. And then we know, okay, this combination here this could this is probably like emitted from some common material that we expect to be in that galaxy and then we can see so if this is the result that we got at this uh, frequency this wavelength then we can then calculate how much it was since we know how much it should be that it, when it was emitted so now that we know that the universe is, ex is expanding like that and it's causing everything to move away from the point that you are we need to say yeah, but can, can we be sure that we are actually not the center i mean everything moving away from us 
to do this, you can imagine that you're making um, you're making bread. You have a uh, you have a big piece of dough, and then for some reason you decided to put raisins in it. So if we take a um, a cross section of that dough with some raisins in it, and we can imagine that we are sitting here and we are let's let's like make two raisins, raisins A and B. We're sitting here on on raisin number A, and now we're putting the dough away, and it'll begin to uh, to to expand as it as it does. We can see here as it expands. It looks, from our point of view, if it expands to twice the size, that everything has moved away um, to twice the distance as it was before. And let's say that this took an hour. Well, then, of course, the, the objects that were far away would have moved. Um, let's say that there were, I don't know, five centimeters to this one over here. Um, it would then have moved away um, five centimeters in the last hour. So it would move five centimeters per hour. But this one that were closer, let's say this is two centimeters away, this would then have moved two centimeters because it's again twice the size, so from two to four. So this will move two centimeters per hour. So you can see that just by having static objects in an expanding medium, you get that effect of further away means moving further, faster away from us as well. Now let's take the same expansion, but this time we're going to look at it from the point of view of someone sitting on raisin number B. And we can see here that we get the exact same view, that everything is moving away from that point when it is expanding. And, and this is why that you would always see yourself as being like the point where everything's moving away from. So you can see now we're getting close to, the, to where we started with that you were the center of the universe. And the last thing you need to look at is, um, is the Hubble sphere, or the Hubble law. Now the Hubble law says that there is a linear, linear <laughs> relation between the distance and how fast things are moving away. Um, so basically, it says that, well, if things are, are this far away, um, it will be moving this far, fast away from us times some, some, uh, some constant. Now, there's nothing, if we go back to the ant example, there's nothing preventing the ant that's walking towards us. It can never walk along the, the, the rubber band faster than the speed of light. But there's nothing preventing us from stretching the, the rubber band faster than the speed of light, hence making the ant move away from each other at more than the speed of light. That is technically uh, technically um, possible and it happens. And this also means that if we, instead of the velocity, we can plug into the Hubble equation here, we could plug in the speed of light as the velocity, then we have a distance. And this is the maximum distance at which things will be, where the universe will be stretched out, it will be stretching out so fast that things are being pulled away from us at the speed of light. Everything further away than that point we can't see because it is moving away from us faster than the speed of light. Everything within that bubble is that's called a Hubble sphere. And that's the observable universe. And as you can see, regardless of where you are, of what you're doing, you will always be the center of your own Hubble sphere and hence the center of at least the observable universe. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, remember to give a like and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, guys. I'll see you in space.